There's a famous saying on Wall Street. And they say that financial markets are driven not by what we might expect, the, the P.E. ratio or the interest rates or all of these different things that people point to. They say that the financial markets are driven by two powerful emotions, fear and greed. There's a famous Wall Street investor. Most of you have heard his name. He's one of the richest men in the world. His name is Warren Buffett. And this is what he says about investing. It's his counsel to those who would invest in the stock market. He says, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Greed and fear, these drivers of the market, are the two emotions, the two characteristics, if you will, that God speaks to us about through his word in the passage that we're going to be in this morning in Luke chapter 12. And so you can begin uh, turning your Bibles there. Greed and fear are the two things uh, that he addresses. We're going to talk about each of these in turn. We'll talk about uh, financial fear and worry next week. We're going to talk about greed as it pertains to money and wealth this week, where greed will take the center stage in uh, Jesus' address in a famous parable called the parable of the rich fool. As Christians in America, greed doesn't often take center stage in our conversation. It doesn't often make the list of terrible sins that I need to avoid, right? Like when we Talk about, like, if you were to make a list before you came in about terrible sins to avoid, maybe adultery would be on the list. Certainly murder would make the list. Lying and deceit and hatred, these would make the list. But for how many American Christians would greed make the list? And yet, the New Testament tells us that greed is idolatry. It's basically making a god out of money. And when you consider it that way, three out of the top ten command, of the Ten Commandments are actually about money. You shall not covet, you shall not steal, and do not worship false gods, in this case, money. It's actually a much bigger deal than we make it. Greed is a much bigger deal than we make it, and, uh, and today we're going to talk about why that is. We're going to talk about why greed is such a big deal and why it's so dangerous to our lives. And if greed, if you came into the room this morning and, and greed wasn't on your list of terrible sins to avoid, if you came into the room this morning and you kind of haven't really thought about greed in a while, then there's a very good chance that greed is secretly lurking in the heart. And God's heart for you And my heart for you is not only that we would be set free from this, but that we would be set free, more importantly, for the true riches that God wants to offer every single person in this room. And that's what this series is really about. Anytime God points out a sin, you know, before I became a believer, I thought, oh, uh, you know, God just wants to take things away. He wants to tell me, I, you know, new things that I can't do or problems with my heart and all of this. But God's heart is always, anytime he says no, it's because he has a much bigger yes. And I want to teach you about the bigger yes, the true riches that God wants to offer you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12. Now, to offer a little bit of context this morning, a little bit of context for where uh, where this passage has uh, has been going. Ever since the last half of Luke chapter 11, Jesus has been confronting the religious leaders for various sins. But what they really come down to is the religious leaders are outwardly really good, but inwardly not so good. They're putting on a show. They have hypocrisy. And interesting, much of what Jesus is addressing in their life is, a, is financial in nature. And apart from blatant fraud, financial sins, sins that relate to money and possessions, have a special ability to lurk beneath the surface of the heart. And so the religious leaders, outwardly, they looked so good, but they had these money sins going on. And so Jesus is addressing them, and then he turns in chapter 12, verse 1, and he addresses his disciples, and he says, watch out for the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And then 
as he begins to, to spell that out, the two things that Jesus addresses are, guess what? Fear and greed. Both of them as they pertain to finances. And so if Jesus is addressing this to his A-team, like the guys who gave up, literally gave up their businesses and sold everything to follow Jesus, if they need to watch out for greed, what do you think about us? Or is that only for other people? That's only for like, like really, really greedy people, okay? So Luke chapter 12, he's turned the attention to the disciples. He's addressed this greed and fear. He's begun to, and, it, and greed will come up right here, beginning in verse 13. Chapter 12, verse 13. It says, Someone in the crowd said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to him, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. <clears throat> and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God true riches. So our approach to the passage this morning is we're going to break it down. We're going to first talk about the hiddenness of greed, then we're going to talk about the foolishness of greed, and then we're going to turn toward the true riches. And we're going to look at what is the running theme, what is all of this driving toward that we need to do in order to experience God's true riches in our life. And so we'll finish there. But first, let's explore this largely unexplored sin, the hiddenness of greed. And we've already talked about it uh, by way of the context, that he's been addressing the secret sins of the Pharisees' hearts. Now he's turned to his disciples to address the secret sins that might pop up in their hearts. So already the context is gearing us to see, hey, this is one of those things that's going to be hard to see. That's why Jesus says in chapter 12, verse 15, he says, take care, a word that's uh, two words that's normally translated as beware, and then the very next thing he says, and be on guard. And I feel convicted about this, and there are going to be times this morning where it does feel a little bit heavy, and it is already a little bit heavier than we normally kind of start out. But I will also tell you, any time that I preach the word of God, I'm preaching just as much to me as I am to you. And the Holy Spirit has begun to convict me of some things in my own heart. Because as I read this passage and I came to that, the Lord of the universe saying, Michael, beware and be on your guard against greed. Covetousness is the word that it uses here. And I come across that and I'm just like, whoa, I mean, couldn't you just said one of them, like, just one beware? <laughs> beware and be on your guard. Like, hey, a team, Jesus says, this is for you. Wellspring Church, Michael Roundtree, it doesn't matter. This is for you. This is a big deal. It lurks beneath the surface. And God wants us to enjoy the true riches. And so the hiddenness of greed, let's, we, we've seen it in the context, but now let's look at it in the text specifically. Okay, and, and in the text specifically, I see two ways in which greed remains hidden. Two reasons that it remains hidden. Number one, Greed seems reasonable. Greed seems reasonable. It was customary in their day because of the way their laws were written. They were written into the Bible, the Old Testament. And so if, if they had an inheritance dispute, well, the Old Testament talks about inheritance laws. In some ways, this was a mark of respect to Jesus as a rabbi, that he's going to bring this before Jesus. Hey, arbitrate, you know, because I see you as somebody who understands what the law of God is about. Okay, and so this is already reasonable because it's what people did. But secondly, if you read the, the scholarly literature about this, they, they point to various contextual details, and they say that this guy 
who, who asks Jesus to address, uh, to address the inheritance deal, he says this guy, it, or they, what they say is that he's probably in the top 1% to 2% of social elites, would have been probably a wealthy landowner. And it seems pretty reasonable that if he stands, if he comes from a, a wealthy portion of society, if he comes from money, I mean, I don't know how much his inheritance was worth, but if he's in the top 1% to 2%, let's call it a million dollars, okay? Let's just say a million dollars. And let's imagine that this dude was truly jilted of a mill. Would you take that in stride? You'd be like, eh, it's just a million, whatever. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? Greed seems reasonable, but it only looks reasonable if you look at it through a narrow lens. And whatever it is, or it's like, well, you need that money, and you need this thing, and you need the, it only seems reasonable from a narrow lens, because if we look at this from a broad lens, the unreasonableness of greed actually comes to light. Let's think about this from a broad lens. This guy was standing five feet away from God, God in the flesh, visited planet Earth, was born of the Virgin Mary, the very one who knit that man together in his mother's womb, who decided the DNA that he would have and decreed that he would be born into the family in which he was born. The one who in that very moment was upholding the universe by the power of his word was speaking words to this man. And all this man could think about was money? In light of that, it makes no sense at all, does it? Like, shouldn't he have just been like, who even cares? This is the king of the universe and the savior of the world. I'm going to listen to him. Greed seems reasonable. That's why it stays hidden from us, and it hides Jesus from us. This guy doesn't even know who he's talking to because he's so wrapped up in the almighty dollar that he can't see that he's having a conversation with Almighty God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the same thing in the, in the religious leaders if we go back to the context of, of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 39, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for greed. You look outwardly righteous because everybody's seeing you pray. Everybody knows you've memorized the Old Testament. Everybody knows you're doing all the things righteous people do, but you're greedy in here. And he rebukes them for their greed. That's verse 39. But here's what gets me. What I think is just so remarkable about Jesus rebuking them for, for greed. In verse 42, he rebukes them again. And he says, you guys tithe mint, cumin, and I, I can't remember. Herbs, I think, is the Luke version. <laughs> Garden produce. We're talking about guys that they didn't just give 10% of their income to God. They gave 10% of their backyard gardens to God. They're like, ah, plucked 10 tomatoes. God gets one. That doesn't sound very greedy to me. What about you? But the Pharisees gave out of their wealth. They didn't give to the poor. He rebukes them in that same section for not giving alms to the poor. I've heard a lot of sermons about giving to the church and tithing to the church. Hey, and I think that's super important. I think it's hugely important. But how often do we hear a sermon about give to the poor? I mean, they say there's 2,000 verses about giving to the poor. One of them is just almost terrifying to me. It says, if you will not hear the cries of the poor, God won't hear your prayers. I mean, this is a huge priority in Scripture. And the question this brings me to is, if the Pharisees who gave 10% of their garden produce to God were wickedly greedy, what does that say about the American church where four out of 10 churchgoers give zero dollars and three out of 10 almost zero dollars? You think this might be more of a thing than we talk about? Greed seems so reasonable, so it hides in our heart, and like it did for the Pharisees and like it did for this man, it hides Jesus from us too. Are you bewaring 
And are you on guard for greed? Has this been primary on your radar? Have you been paying attention, or has it just been lurking in the background you think is not there? Greed seems reasonable. Number one. Number two, greed takes many forms. Greed takes many forms. Another reason why greed remains hidden. We see this in verse 15. Also, when Jesus says, to be on guard against all covetousness, he says. Did you notice that word, all? Some translations will say every kind of greed or every form of covetousness. There's more than one form of greed. We tend to think of greed as just being the money grubber grubber who's like, give me more, give me more, an insatiable craving to have more money. But greed can also take the form of possessiveness and unwillingness to have less money. Greed can look like the workaholic pursuit of money or the shopaholic pursuit of things. It can look like disproportionate savings, disproportionate spending, or disproportionate investing that is disproportionate to our gifts to others. It can look like jealousy for what we don't have, or it can look like smug self-sufficiency over what we do have. I always get convicted by that prayer in Proverbs 30 where the guy says, uh, he's praying and and he says, Lord, give me not too much lest I forget God or curse him and give me not too little that I be tempted to steal, but give me just my daily bread. Wealth can have an effect upon our heart and I know 99% of the people in the room are like, I'm not wealthy, (laughs) Amen, that's how I feel. But relative to the rest of the world that has ever existed anywhere, including in this age or any age, we live in the wealthiest nation that has ever lived. I mean, I had some kids from Uganda. They visited my house, and I, uh, I had a you know, kind of normal house, and they, they just walk in, and they go, you live in a mansion. I'm like, you should see Colleyville. <laughs> no. No offense, Colleyville people. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's perspective, isn't it? I, uh, I was reading a book by, uh, this is probably 10, 15 years ago. It's an older book. Um, I mean, I read it back then. It was by a guy named uh, Shane Claiborne. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah. He has a book called Irresistible Revolution, and in it he, he, he points this out. And he's like, this is just like the secret sin of the church that nobody notices, nobody talks about. It's just there. And pastors are okay. As long as you just give me your 10% cut, we're good. There's no such thing as greed. And we look at the Pharisees and they're like, here's your 10% cut. And Jesus is like, you're greedy. And it's just like, and we just, it goes completely under the radar. So he's saying a bunch of this stuff. And one of the things that he does is he, uh, is he quotes some church fathers. Because the church throughout history was especially known, get this, for caring about the poor. The church throughout history was known. I mean, they would be like, man, we hate, I mean, this is what the pagans would say, we hate what Christians believe. I mean, they believe terrible things. Oh, it's a, you, know, you know, they just go off and off on how much they hate what Christians believe. But, but you know what? They're really good at caring for the poor. I mean, I've read so many quotes that are just like that. Here's one quote that I remembered after all of these years, because it always convicts me when I read it. It's by a guy writing in the 4th century, uh, Basil of Caesarea. Here's what he says. He says, The bread in your cupboard belongs to the hungry man. The coat hanging in your closet belongs to the man who needs it. The shoes rotting in your closet belong to the man who has no shoes. The money which you put in the bank belongs to the poor. You do wrong to everyone that you could help but fail to help. Another church father writing around the same time, St. Augustine, is actually commenting on this very parable. He says, the rich fool did not realize that the bellies of the poor make much safer storerooms than his barns. Now listen, I know that like this can reach an extreme, okay, where we're not allowed to have anything, right? Like you just can't enjoy anything that God's given you because there's always another poor person to feed. Like Jesus says, the poor are always with you. So, So does this mean that it's like, If I'm not giving literally everything away at every moment, and Jesus tells multiple people, he'll tell a guy in Luke chapter 18, a few chapters later, sell everything, give it to the poor, and follow me. And he tells people that sometimes. 
And, and if you also look at throughout church history, they took care of the poor really well, but another thing that they did was uh, that they had this sort of asceticism where they had to like give up everything and all material things were bad. And so there are these two extremes where one is like all material things are bad, rich people are evil, and all of that, and those aren't the attitudes that we find in the Bible, but you see people occasionally on one side going over here, and then on the other side, there's the extreme of greed. And I think just a couple of things. First of all, momentarily, I'll talk about how do we actually not go to either extreme, okay? How do we actually do what God wants us to do, to enjoy the blessings that he's given us, but at the same time be generous, as generous as God wants us to be? How do, how do we do that? Without, we'll, we'll address that, but I think first I would say this. How many people in the room are really in danger of giving away too many of their possessions for the poor? Like, is, is this a serious danger in your life? Because I think, again, we as Americans, we immediately go to that place, like, what's he going to tell me to do, give 11%? Ah, you know, like, <laughs> we, we like our stuff. And, and so, uh, and so I, I think this is not really a danger that we're really facing giving too much to the poor. But I will say, and I told you this at the beginning, that, uh, that I've, been, I've felt convicted of this. And it was when I got to that part in verse 15, because when I preach, I'm preaching to myself always. And I got to verse 15, and it was, beware, be on guard, Michael. And I thought about these Pharisees who were patting themselves on the back, because I give my garden produce. And it was like the Holy Spirit began to convict me, because, hey, I've always been a giver. I've always given more than 10% and, and to the poor and to missions. And I, I am a giver. I, I feel pretty good about myself. And, and as I'm reading and I hear the words of our Lord and the Holy Spirit repeating them in my heart, beware and be on guard. I say, okay, well, Jesus, speak to me. And it's like that prayer in Psalm 139, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to pray that prayer over this passage. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, you who thought there's no way I have greed in my heart, I want even you to say, Holy Spirit, search me in this area. Do I have greed in my heart? And I'll tell you, the answer from the Holy Spirit for me was yes. And part of it came through that quote from Basil of Caesarea, it was like he was going through my closet. He's like, shoes, jackets, like all of these things. You know what I started to think about? And I started to think about, well, one, the fact that I have like four jackets I haven't worn in a year. <laughs> but secondly, what I started to think about, you remember, they call it snowpocalypse now. The freeze day, the 100-year freeze day we had in February. You remember that? Well, so I have a pool. I know rich guy with a pool. I have a pool. And I started to feel really convicted over my extra jackets. 57 people died in Texas during that storm. And I was more concerned about a frozen pool than frozen people. And the Holy Spirit began to convict my heart. I told my wife Alicia about it later. It was like, it was like the Holy Spirit was saying, your, your, your closets are a reflection of your heart. Your storage bins are a reflection of your heart. When Jesus is talking about possessions, he's not even just talking about money. He's talking about all the stuff and all the things. And I think we just, over time, accumulate all of these things. I didn't think I'd quote from Gandhi this morning, but hey, a quote's coming to me. He says, there's always enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And if everybody shared... And if we gave, if we had the attitude of the early church, if we had the attitude that Jesus is advocating here, the financial reality for people around the state of Texas and around the world would be very different. The Apostle Paul really challenges us. He says there should be equality financially. He says, hey, you rich churches share with those poor churches. And it's so important that we see how, how big of a deal this is to God. In Acts chapter 2, God pours his Holy Spirit out on the church, and we love to point to the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the salvations, but what about the generosity? 
And people are selling their fields and laying the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. You want a move of the Spirit in the church? Do you? Are you willing to sell a field or a house? I mean, what does that even look like? I'm not saying, hey, you know, God's going to give you X amount of dollars if you lay your proceeds at my feet. I'm not saying anything like that. What I am saying is the possessor of heaven and earth, God has claim on everything you own. And the question is not, do I pay my God tax of 10% and move on with life? But God, you get everything. What do you want me to keep? And so greed seems reasonable. And there are many forms of greed. That's why it stayed hidden in my heart. That's why it stays hidden in our hearts, the hiddenness of greed. So let's talk about the foolishness of greed, the foolishness of greed now. This is another one of the major themes in the passage, when in verse 20, the rich man thinks he's got all this time to live, and that night his soul is required of him, and he stands before God, and the first word out of God's mouth is fool. I can't imagine a worse word to hear out of the mouth of the Lord for me, okay? Do you want the Lord to say that to any of us? Like, that's, that's frightening. But the foolishness of greed, one thing that fools do or that foolishness does is it, is it makes false assumptions. Greed makes false assumptions. And I want to point two of those out in the passage. Number one, greed assumes that wealth is self-generated, not God-given. Greed assumes that wealth is self-generated, but not God-given. This one's very subtle. It it arises in verse 16, where it says that the land of a certain rich man produced plentifully. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the rich man produced plentifully. It says the land produced plentifully. And and I think, again, I, I love my nation I really do love America, but in America, we have a certain culture, and the culture goes something like this. Hey, I pulled myself up by the the bootstraps, I worked really hard, I got an education, I invested time, I invested money in making this thing work. Like, you can't just tell me that this had nothing to do with me. I'm not saying it had nothing to do with you. The Proverbs do say that diligence and hard work do actually lead to wealth. I'm not saying it had nothing to do with you, but I'm saying there are lots of things that could have been different that could have had you living in a landfill if circumstances had changed. What if you had been born in a landfill in India? Would you have what you have right now? Or what if you were one of those kids that they don't just grow up in a landfill, but people actually blind them intentionally so that more people will have compassion on them and give them more alms. What if you were that kid? Would you have the wealth that you have? What if you were born with a birth defect? What if at the age of 30 you had a debilitating stroke with the left side of your body, or, or maybe you lost your speech? There's a lot of what-ifs here that had to happen. And even Even if we say, you know what, you did work hard and you do have a certain skill set, what if God gave you a different skill set? What if your skill set wasn't leadership and management, but it was like the Dewey Decimal System? (laughs) What if your greatest skill was basket weaving? I mean, I don't know what they pay basket weavers, but I don't think it's the same as entrepreneurs and managers. It's like God says to Deuteron- in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He tells the Israelites, says, you guys are about to go into the promised land, and you're going to be land flowing milk and honey. It's going to be good times. You're going to get wealthy, and then you'll get really proud in your heart. And when that happens, he says, remember, it wasn't just me who gave you your wealth. It was me who gave you the ability to make that wealth in the first place. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's not. I mean, John Wesley says, make as much money as you can and give as much money as you can, okay? There's nothing wrong with wealth in and of itself, but Jesus does point it out when he repeatedly says, you can't worship God and money. You can't worship God and money. Like, I just wonder, like, why doesn't he say that about other things? 
You can't worship God in sex, or you, you can't worship God in this or that. Like, there's so many other, you, you can't worship God in anything else. You can only worship God, but why does he keep coming back to money? Because money makes such a great idol, as in a terrible idol, right? We think it makes a great idol. But it's so easy to fall for that trap, and the Bible says greed is idolatry. And so we, we, in this culture, we so easily say we were the ones that got it. Greed assumes that wealth is self-generated, not God-given, number one. Number two, greed assumes that life is earthly, not eternal. Greed assumes that life is earthly, not eternal. And this is maybe, uh, this is just one of the primary focuses of the parable, and we can see this in the fact that verse 15 is what introduces the parable, and here's what verse 15 says. Jesus says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, and then he goes on to describe uh, this parable. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Life is the word I want to focus on. In English, we have one word for life. Do you know what it is? Life, okay. <laughs> and in Greek, there are three words for life. And, uh, and Jesus' word choice here is significant. Jesus' word choice here is significant. He could have said, uh, he could have used the Greek word bios, from which we get the word biology, right? It refers to what you would naturally think of, biological, physical, earthly life. That's not the word Jesus used, but he could have used that word. But why doesn't he use that word? Well, one reason is that, in a sense, bios life, earthly life, is directly tied to uh, the abundance of possessions. They've done studies on this. They've looked at the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor, and what they've found is that rich people live, on average, 12 years longer than poor people. They can afford the health care. They can afford the amenities. They can afford the things that poor people are just left to die because of. Okay? And so he didn't choose bios as his word. Instead, he used a different word for life. It's the word zoe. This is the word you find in John 10.10 10, where Jesus says, I have uh, the thief, who's the devil, has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have zoe, life, and have it abundantly. This is the abundant, eternal life that Jesus came to offer. And normally, the way this word is translated is as eternal life. Now, when you see the word eternal life in the scripture, when you see that, I mean, obviously, it speaks of a duration of life. It is life that lasts forever. It is eternal. But it's not just quantitative. Eternal life in the scripture is also qualitative. It's a quality of life. It's a real life. The, to borrow John 10, 10, the abundant life, the quintessential life that Jesus came to offer. This word, life, in a word, is true riches. Verse 21, it's being rich toward God, to have this Zoe life. And money might be able to offer you a more abundant bios type of life, but money cannot give you abundant Zoe. It cannot give you Zoe at all. Only Jesus can do that. And the reason only Jesus can give you true riches, the reason only Jesus can give you abundant life, real life, quintessential, eternal life, the reason only Jesus can give you these things is because at some point or another in all of our lives, all of us have been the rich fool. All of us have been greedy, and that's just one sin on the terrible list of sins to avoid. We've basically committed all of them. Our sin list was mounted to the heavens, and as finite, broken human beings, we didn't have the capacity to forgive ourselves of a single one of them, much less the entire mountain, which is why Jesus left heaven, and he came to earth, and he died bankrupt on the cross literally stripped of the clothes off of his back. I mean, have you ever been so poor you were literally naked? That was Jesus at the end of his life. Why did he become so poor? To make you rich. 
to make you rich with true riches, the abundant life, the eternal life. He died to pay our sin debt. He surrendered his bios on the cross so that he might give you Zoe, eternal life. If we just, if we just believe in him and repent of our sins, if we surrender everything to him, he gives us back true riches. And so have you done that this morning? Have you repented of your sins? Have you come to Jesus for life? Or has Jesus just been sort of a thing on the side? Has he been like a slice of the pie that has a lot of other things, and it's got kids' sports, and it's got your career, and it's got all these, and I've got my Jesus slice over here? Or is he the ingredient that goes throughout the whole pie? Have you trusted him for life? Because he wants to give you true riches. So now I want to uh, come back to a question I I said earlier we would address, and uh, and that was how do we avoid the extremes? You remember that? On one hand, we've been talking about the extreme of greed, but also there's this extreme of false guilt, like I I can't have two coats because that'll make me a greedy sinner. Like, is that what that automatically means? So, So how do we walk this balance? And the answer in Ecclesiastes 7.18, it says that the fear of God avoids all extremes. The fear of God avoids all extremes. And if anything, I think this passage is actually, even more than it's about greed, I think it's about the fear of the Lord. A lot of people try to make the fear of the Lord an, an entirely Old Testament thing. Oh, well, back then they feared the Lord, but now we love the Lord. And it's like, no, we love him, then we fear the Lord. It's both, and it's replete throughout the New Testament that we are to fear God. But fearing God is the answer. Only the fear of God will guard your heart from greed and for true riches. Now I want to show you this in the text. So in verse 19, in verse 19, we see the the rich fool, and he uses the third Greek word for life. It's the word psyche, which is an English word. It also is the root for the word psychology. And this word has a little bit uh, broader meaning than the other two words generally, but it does generally mean something like your inner life. And it's used in verses 19 and 20, and the way it's translated here is with the word soul. So let's read verses 19 and 20 again. This is that third Greek word for life, translated soul. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So you see it's like his inner life. It's this inner dialogue that's going on. He says, relax, eat, drink, be merry. And then God responds with the same word for soul. This night your soul will be required of you. In verse 20, what does that mean when he says your soul will be required of you? What it means is that God demands a return. That one day you, one day I will stand before God. And I think Christians, we miss out on this because we've heard our whole lives like, hey, you, you just get born again and you go to heaven and sing hallelujah for the rest of our lives, but you actually will stand before God. Every single person will die and then face the judgment. And unbelievers will die and they will go to hell. And it's very, very sad. And I hate that, but it's true and it's a reality. And, and, and when I say I hate that, I hate it in the sense that, not in the sense that God's justice is wrong, I hate it in the sense that my heart beats for the lost to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't have to be that way. At the same time, just because your sins have been forgiven, and you've been born again, and you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, like, you're not just going to, like, skirt into heaven, like, okay, God, don't look at me, like, no, no, you, you will stand before God, too. And you'll stand before him, and that's what this passage is about. Your soul is required of you. That is, your soul was loaned to you. Your days and your dollars were a temporary loan from God. And there will come a day when he demands his return. And so we have to ask ourselves, why was I born in the richest nation in all of history? Why? I may not feel rich, but why did he give me the money that he did give me? And why did he give me the life that he gave me? And why did he save me from that train wreck? And why did he do this? Why am I still here? Your days and your dollars are on loan. And one day God will demand a return. And I think that should put the fear of God in us. Now, that's not like bad news. It's really not. Because ultimately, God wants to pay you back. 
Because you lay your life down for Jesus and you live for him and you give him your days and your dollars and he pays you back with treasures in heaven, which we'll talk about next week. He'll pay you back to where, like, the, the sacrifice, the, the greatest sacrifice that you make will feel like nothing. It'll feel like nothing in comparison. His purpose is he actually just wants to reward you, but you will have to stand before him, and so will I. And that should cause the fear of God to come over us, and that's a good thing. Because when you tremble before the Almighty, isn't that the appropriate response? Should we be casual and flippant with the Almighty? When you tremble before the Almighty, it makes you really diligent and vigilant to beware and to be on guard for greed. And not only that, but it protects you from all extremes, from false guilt for enjoying anything nice on one side to greed on the other. The fear of God is what guards our hearts. And you might say, well, well, Michael, just kind of help me out practically. What does that look like in my finances? This will be our last point. Because I do want to get practical here, because it's just like fear God. What, what, how? <laughs> what does that look like? Okay. And so here's, here's our last point. I'll say it, and then I'll show you from the text. Uh, this is what it looks like to, to fear God with your finances. Give God the first word about your money. Give God the first word about your money. If you fear God, that's what you'll do. And we see that here in this man's in, inner dialogue in verses 17 to 18. What I want you to pay special attention to is the pronoun that's repeated, okay? He says, what shall I do? He's talking to himself, his soul talk. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I will store all my grains in my goods. I want to say, wait, whose goods? Because God's the possessor of heaven and earth. All of this is just a loan from him. Where's God in that conversation? And when it comes to our finances, this is often the case. We give God our 10% God tax if we do that. We give them our God, and then it's just like we run with it. It's like, no, every day and every dollar belongs to God. And so what does it look like to give him the first word over our finances? The first word over the possessions that you already have. What does that look like in your life? That's what the fear of God is, because God owns your life. He owns my life. He can recall our life and our dollars at any moment that he desires. And I don't know about you, but I want my heart protected from greed in that day. I want my heart to be guarded. And one of my biggest prayers right now is that I could just be faithful to the end, like fully, fully faithful. And not distracted with greed, not distracted from like, I've just seen so much tribalism and in the church in our nation these days, not distracted from all the things. I want this just pure love for Jesus. That's what I want more than anything in the world. If I can stand before God at the end of my life and actually make my dad proud, there is something in your soul you want to make dad proud. And it might have started with your earthly dad. Some of you didn't grow up with it, and it, and it like creates all kinds. Of, there, there is a cry for dad in your heart, and one day you will stand before dad, and he wants the privilege of bragging before you to all the angels, and maybe it's, I gave this person a huge inheritance and millions of dollars, and look at the way they spread my word in my kingdom and cared for the poor. He wants the privilege to brag on you. The praises of this world will die when you die. But the praise of our heavenly Father, well done, my good and faithful servant, the praise of our heavenly Father, because he is infinite, will grow for all of eternity, and it will surpass every financial sacrifice you have ever made, and the only thing you will say is it was worth it, it was worth it, it was so worth it. Lay down your life for the one who laid down his life for you. Let's pray.